It's nice to be back. I, I regret to tell you that the first uh, edition of the Handbook of Estonia has sold out. Um, <laughs> but the good news is uh, we're editing a second volume, and it should be out in time for the American Academy of Neurology. So uh, uh, keep your uh, expectations there. Uh, it's nice to be back. Uh, it's nice to see uh, members of class of 1986, but I have to tell you, it's really taken my maturity level back, way <laughs> back down where it, it should have been. Uh, but I'll try to be a little bit grown up and uh, talk about uh, some of these uh, things that interest me. Uh, I'm interested in Parkinson's disease, and uh, when I was in Phoenix, one uh, week, during the course of a, of a week, I had a patient come in and his wife said, Doctor, since you've last seen him, which was three months ago, he's lost $60,000 in a Native American gambling casino. Two days later, a, a woman came in with her husband and said, Doctor, since the last time you've seen him, he's lost $60,000 in a Native American gambling casino. So I would tell you that uh, I believe that was probably my fault, and I went and looked at what I had done, and I had increased the dose of a dopamine agonist. Um, one was Mirapex, a common drug for Parkinson's disease. Another one was Permax, another common drug for Parkinson's, within the dosing level. Uh, but it was just like a, a, a switch had been turned off. And the reason they both lost $60,000 is that people in our demographic, if we've had good credit all of our lives and we decide to go to a casino, the, the uh, MasterCard company will allow twenty grand per month to be lost in a casino. Um, so it's a wonderful thing to discover these things, uh, but uh, uh, it puts significant impact uh, on uh, this population. In terms of my conflicts of interest, uh, I would tell you that um, Boinger Ingelheim is a maker of uh, Permipexol, and so I have been involved in uh, helping them to uh, really change their labeling and to look at the uh, frequency of these things. And, and I will tell you, two senior members of uh, the uh, uh, movement disorders community came to me when I first reported nine patients with pathological gambling uh, on these drugs, saying, I'm not sure you should report this. There are a lot of people that use those drugs. Um, and it may be a spurious uh, observation. Uh, I guess I'm not thankful to uh, tell you that we now know it's about 14% of the population, uh, but it has um, been an evolving phenomenon. And what we've learned is uh, um, uh, that these are addiction disorders. So this is a case report uh, of a patient uh, who is a 48-year-old retired Marine colonel, had Parkinson's disease, was started on a common drug, selegiline, um, and started on levodopa and a, a new drug called ritigatine, which is a drug that is now off the market, but people are trying to bring that back on the market. He always reported that he liked to recreational gamble. He would uh, have uh, golfing when he, uh, when he golfed, he would gamble. He had a weekly poker game. But once he started taking medications for Parkinson's disease, he uh, began to gamble more aggressively. And his wife uh, discovered that he had completely dis uh, dissipated their savings account. Uh, and they were $200,000 light. Um, that didn't go over well, and she left him. Um, and I got a call from, or a coordinator got a call from a, uh, uh, his, uh, from the wife saying, my daughter's bringing him in. I saw this on CNN. I think he has this problem. Don't talk about the cross-dressing. Well, I grew up in Missouri. Uh, cross-dressing is not something that I learned about in medical school, and I certainly didn't want to talk about it. Um, <laughs> And so he came in and I think illustrates this problem of deranged expectations, this feeling that you can't ever get a reward. You keep having to up the stimuli. And so uh, he was being kicked out of his apartment complex because he was mowing the lawn with one of those old push mowers all day long. Then at night he would take apart this push mower and put it back together all night long. And I asked him why he was doing that. And he said, well, my wife left. And I couldn't gamble anymore. I don't have any money. And she took all of her clothes. So I can't cross-dress anymore. <laughs> so if you think about it, you, think, you see this drive of, of something has to get out. Something has to be rewarded. And so he was left with this repetitive motor activity that we call punding. And punding is a, a, a Swedish term meaning blockhead. And it was coined by amphetamine addicts who noticed that when people overdosed amphetamines, they would go have this repetitive motor behavior. Now, the same receptor that is triggered by cocaine, amphetamine, uh, is, tr is, is triggered by levodopa and dopamine. And so I think that's why we have these similar problems. And if you think about addiction, if you have this much dopamine in your system and you take cocaine, and you, have, you up your dopamine in this, this system, 
you feel much better. In Parkinson's disease, you lose 80% of your dopamine. So it doesn't take very much to overstimulate that, uh, the brain and cause this derangement in behavior. So that's essentially my talk if you want to stop. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the things we look at in Parkinson's disease are receptors in the basal ganglia. So we look at a D2 receptor and we try to balance it with a D1 receptor. So we know that D1 overstimulation leads to dyskinesias. Michael J. Fox has these wiggly movements from dyskinesias. And we now believe that the D2 stimulation leads to these pathological behaviors. And what we've also learned is the D3 system is where reward is mediated in the brain. And in Parkinson's disease, D2 drops out and D3 increases. And the two medicines that I started those patients on that, had, that triggered this observation were on medicines that were D3 act more active than D2. So we set apart this uh, distance between um, the D2 setting a reward expectation and D3 setting the reward confirmation. So, let's see. so this is uh, kind of a start of, a, 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 of the talk to kind of tie it all together. It's a very interesting paper that was published last year, and it basically looks at imaging of belief, disbelief, and uncertainty. And so they looked at 14 patients, and they gave them three sets of questions. So the question that you would believe uh, 2 plus 6 plus 8 equals 16, that you wouldn't believe, and then a question that you couldn't know about, you were uncertain about. And so they were imaged when they were given these questions, and they were given the certain questions all in a row, the uncertain questions all in a row, and the um, uh, unknown questions all in a row, or belief, disbelief, and, uh, and uncertain. Uh, and I'll let you read through those. My uh, favorite is this one, um, ethical. So remember we go through belief, disbelief, and uncertainty. I just don't think, I just don't have a lot of uncertainty about that. So I would say that there are, there are some design problems in maybe some of their questions. Uh, but uh, what they found was that belief seemed to be correlated with the, with the frontal lobe. Uh, and if you think about Alzheimer's disease and these diseases with loss of fr frontal lobe uh, behavior, you can think about belief problems. Disbelief uh, is associated with uh, uh, the uh, inferior, uh, the superior part of lombril, really. And then uncertainty uh, is anterior cingulate cortex. Meanwhile, back in, oh, meanwhile, oh, I've never been cut off this early. Um, so if we look at the cortical system, the cortical reward system, the mesocortical dopaminergic system is a prefrontal system that deals with enjoyment, reward. Uh, so that is the satiety center cortically from these basal gangliated mediated functions. And this is a study, and uh, the kind word for this is the oh-no response. So this is the instant a patient realizes that he has made a mistake and a math error. Uh, and I would tell you, uh, if you think about that being uncertainty, when we used to think that was the, uh, the, the point of we didn't, that that was, you weren't uncertain about a decision. I would say that this helps us to say that you were uncertain about the decision, but you thought you had made an error. And that is mediated through the uh, mesocortical system. The mesolimbic system is the drive. So it is involved in a, an appetitive stimuli. It is the drive to make you seek uh, nourishment, uh, to seek uh, other things that are associated with the reward after that, and that's the craving. So the uh, heroin addict, the first one's free, the first time it's enjoyable, and then the craving takes over. And this is how uh, um, our brains change when we're exposed to these drugs. Now let's look at what happens in pathological gambling. And this is a, uh, a, a, uh, an image of a patient who was put through a uh, floral deoxy pet study. So this uh, deoxy pet, pet just looks at brain activity. It doesn't look at neurotransmitter activity. It just looks where the, the brain is working. And so there's a control group and a gambling group that didn't have Parkinson's disease. And they went through 250 trials of blackjack. And you can see that at, this is uh, after the 250 trials, you can see that there's more activity in the basal ganglia when compared to controls. And prior to this activity, prior to the gambling exercise, it was just the opposite. So if you think about reward and addiction, if you have a low level of dopaminergic activity at baseline and you, your brain senses it needs more dopamine, you may be more prone to get addicted to these type of behaviors because it feeds the brain with more neurotransmitter release. 
So the impulse control uh, disorder uh, we defined in, a, in the first annual, uh, um, or the first, not annual, first uh, international impulse control disorders summit in Parkinson's disease. And if you think the handbook of dystonia is exciting, <laughs> let me tell you about putting all these people together. So we defined uh, that uh, this syndrome was, a, was a, a system of purposeless, disruptive behaviors and punding I'd mentioned before. So if you have a, a patient, uh, there are a lot of, arti of artist Parkinson's patients. A lot of them can't stop painting, or they can't stop working crossword puzzles, or they can't stop knitting, uh, or they can't stop playing on the Internet, or they can't stop uh, looking at pornography on the Internet. These are type of punding behaviors, and it's a loss of the sati satiety at the end. Destructive behaviors would be compulsive spending, binge eating, uh, hiring prostitutes, um, very destructive sort of things. And addictive behavior would be uh, taking too much of your dopamine replacement therapy, just like taking too much cocaine, too much amphetamine, or things like that. And if we think about this synapse, so this is the, uh, the, brain, the, part, the, the nerve affected in Parkinson's disease, and with this dying back, you begin to lose synaptic concentrations of dopamine. Um, and this cell begins to die back. So if you look at receptors of how dopamine is conserved, the dopamine transporting molecule is how dopamine is picked up. It also picks up amphetamine, cocaine, and MPP+. Plus. And you might remember that MPTP, the story uh, actually by Bill Langston, was the first person to describe it, who uh, was a, 70, no, a 66 graduate, graduated with Ted Groshong. Uh, but he first described MPTP as a cause of Parkinson, Parkinsonism in drug addicts who made their own Demerol poorly, uh, but did try to make their own Demerol in California. And, and that's how that molecule caused Parkinson's disease. So if you think about uh, what could happen, so I would say that punding would be from amphetamine, cocaine, dopamine, and levodopa, and is a presynaptically mediated phenomenon, while addictive behaviors uh, would be from dopamine agonist, and that's a postsynaptically mediated phenomenon. And this dopamine dysregulation, this seeking drug, is from low concentrations of dopamine in the synapse. And that's how we try to divide these up. Uh, and we talk about with dyskinesias, these abnormal motor behaviors. Dyskinesias are a presynaptic behavior, while a, a complicated dyskinesia is a postsynaptic behavior. So we manage motor loops now the same way we're going to manage these behavioral loops by trying to manage dopamine. So originally I, pub I published nine patients who had pathological gambling and we thought the uh, estimated frequency based on that study looking at my database to be about one and a half percent of patients. We now know lo after looking at more than 3,000 patients that it's probably 14 percent and maybe higher in patients with problem gambling, hypersexuality, compulsive shopping, and binge eating. And we see these risk factors. So the drug that I originally had started them on, a dopamine agonist, is much more likely to cause these behaviors uh, as well as these risk factors, which are the same for pathological gambling in the general population. This is how we divided them up, uh, and we did a case control to compare age match samples of patients without impulse control disorder and patients with impulse control disorder, and we divided them into this. And we looked at risk factors again in a very careful fashion. Um, and uh, even I get bored with this slide. So all I'll uh, point out to you uh, is that uh, it, it is a dopaminergic phenomenon, uh, mediated phenomenon. Just to kind of drive it home a little bit more, here is Nora Volkow's experiment looking at drug addicts and giving them Ritalin or methylphenidate and asking them to rate how high they felt and comparing that to change in dopamine release. So uh, Andrew Evans decided to do the same thing um, and he rated, he uh, looked at percent of dopamine release in the brain and asked the patient how, if they wanted more drug and found that uh, what we see, uh, this was the data that made us think this was a D3 receptor mediated phenomenon in the uh, nucleus accumbens and ventral striatum. And here's where the uh, imaging suggested uh, that uh, this was the problem. Now, the interesting thing to me uh, is uh, this is the perfect storm. Uh, for a, a, a patient uh, with Parkinson's. So here are controls, and we look at task switching costs, so the amount of psychic energy, if you will, to change your mind versus the uh, graph below of impulsivity, your willingness to change your mind. And those are yin and yang in terms of this, uh, uh, this thing. And if you look at impulsivity in the patient, disease, patient with Parkinson's who's not on medication, 
they are still more impulsive than the patient, uh, than the control, but their resistance to changing their mind, their rigidity or inflexibility may be protecting them from making these horrible decisions. And then I put them on medication, drive their impulsivity way up, and reduce their resistance. Uh, resistance is futile, I suppose, in this. Uh, and so uh, over-treating a patient with Parkinson's therapy puts them at high risk for this. We've also learned, uh, uh, based on some of these uh, patients, and one of the original nine patients that I reported uh, committed suicide later after we gave, put her, uh, gave her DBS, um, a very rare thing in Parkinson's disease, and we found that if you put somebody on stimulator with a deep brain stimulation, stimulation they, their resistance, uh, their ability to resist lots of conflict disappears. So the more complicated you make a, a decision, the more likely they want to make a decision and move on in, in task and behavioral tasks. And so this young woman committed suicide while she was waiting for a fiance to return from home because she had gambled away all their money before, she had recovered, she relapsed, and he, she didn't want him to come home and she had to tell him, so she killed herself. Um, and I think that we understand that better now, and now we counsel our patients getting DBS and their families that we have to watch for this phenomenon. And the most interesting paper that I've seen in the last year um, was put out uh, by a, a woman in Spain, and she's actually demonstrated that patients with impulse control disorder have a different subthalamic nucleus profile than patients with levodopa-induced dyskinesias. So the behavioral component of, of a levodopa or dopaminergic toxicity is going to be in the ventral, ventral subthalamic nucleus, and the motor component is going to be in the dorsal subthalamic nucleus. The subthalamic nucleus is smaller than my little fingernail. I just think that is astounding that we could produce such different behavioral uh, phenomenon with that, with a change in an electrical uh, stimulation. So in summary for this, what I want you to remember is the nucleus accumbens is, is probably responsible for the craving in the behavior, and that's a mesolimbic phenomenon in D2, 3 mediated, while the drive for, uh, uh, or the uh, reward is a D1 and D4 mediated phenomenon, and levodopa and dopamine agonist are the, are the major problems that trigger this condition. I think I'll move on to placebo effect because I'm running out of time. So placebo effect has been around a long time. Everybody should remember somewhere in medical school that they heard the name Beecher and the power for placebo. Um, I would say that we've always known about placebo, and if James Parkinson could treat Parkinson's disease with blistering in the skin, leeches, um, uh, and, um, uh, sever and uh, lesioning in the medulla, and patients got better from that, um, that probably is a pretty good placebo effect. I would go on to tell you that if you uh, survive the Middle Ages because you believe that all of the bleeding and all of the leeches and all the things that were being done to you was going to be helpful, and somehow that belief, trans uh, belief um, resulted in increased survival, we are evolving as a, um, uh, as a species to become more vulnerable and benefit more from a placebo effect. Um, and I would tell you that we've learned that big interventions lead to possibly a bigger placebo effect, which is why Parkinson's patients are victims of these charlatans who uh, prey on their desperate hopes and fears to get better, which is why they go to Germany and spend $26,000 to get stem cells, and they don't know what that is. They do that in Mexico, or they go to Florida and get glutathione infusion. IV glutathione doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, but somehow it cures Parkinson's disease. And these people who are trading on their placebo abilities uh, are, are a, a, a scourge to our profession. Uh, sorry, soapboxy. Um, here is a very interesting study looking at placebo effect. Uh, now, this uh, investigator is now at Duke, but as the associate dean for clinical research at Duke, I would not have let him do this trial, at least uh, when I was in charge. So he recruited people over the Internet for, a pain, uh, for treatment of pain and told them that they were going to receive a medicine that was like codeine, and they wanted to rate how they did. And then he randomized them. When we randomized one group to say, you got the full price codeine, here we go, and he randomized the other group saying, great news, you get the same codeine, but, we, but instead of paying $4 a pill for it, we're only paying 15 cents. Guess what? So... The pain improvement 
at regular price was much better than the low price. Which one was placebo? Both. And I think it just goes to the power of the mind and the power of that suggestion. And uh, I spent my life trying to develop new drugs for uh, Parkinson's disease and other disorders. And you can't believe your own press. You have a placebo effect. I think it's one place to have a placebo effect in your clinical practice if you don't get paid for it um, uh, or you don't sell the substance. But it's another place to get a placebo effect in, uh, in your practice or in your clinical trials because it messes up the clinical trial. So here's a very interesting study that looked at um, trials in which the endpoint was death. Now, in Parkinson's, we argue a lot about endpoint. But death is not a difficult endpoint to argue. And, we, and these very clever people looked at just the placebo groups in all of these large trials, and they compared the, the placebo adherers to the placebo, to the placebo the patients who didn't take placebo. Now, I know we're big in evidence-based medicine these days, and so when I have to lecture neurology residents on evidence-based medicine, I tell them, if you're going to give a patient a placebo, make sure they're going to take it because they will live 30% longer. <laughs> now, there are a lot of things, I think, that go on, go on with being adherent to a medical therapy, but just to, to look at a difference of taking a placebo versus not to improve lifespan is an interesting thing to consider. It doesn't matter, in reality, if you tell a patient they're on placebo or not. So here's a group of placebo-informed compared to placebo-uninformed patients. And you can see that the placebo-uninformed did a little bit worse, but not statistically different, and the, chain, and, the, and the benefit was the same, whether they knew they were on placebo or whether they didn't. Now, here's where my mother would be upset, but she lives in Cape Girardeau, and if, nobody, if every promise is not to tell, I'll go through this slide. So um, this was an experiment done in France, and they identified a group of patients, of participants, nobody had any illness here, who were religious, defined as going to confession once a week, a Bible study once a week, and a, another church service once a week, versus non-religious. And they showed them these two pictures. I don't think I ought to let this go through Duke either. Um, so they uh, showed them this picture, then they gave them shocks for 12 seconds. So 30 seconds showing the picture, and then painful shocks for 12 seconds, and then they had to rate their pain. And if you look down here, the non-religious group didn't matter what picture they saw, it hurt. The religious group with the religious condition had a statistically different response when they stared at that picture. Now, they may have been saying they knew they were supposed to feel better when they were looking at this religious picture, so they may not have been telling the truth. Uh, but I think it's interesting that just the concept of religion can make a difference in terms of pain perception. This is an, an, a study uh, done, um, actually, some of it was done in Unity Village, Missouri. I don't know where that is, but uh, they basically wanted to look at uh, intervention uh, for cardiac disorders in patients who had a faith. So there was a no faith, didn't matter the faith, or a faith, and they compared the rate of um, cardiac ischemia, ischemia and death, and as you can see, the patients who were... Um, who had a faith did better than the patients who did not. Then they went back and said, all right, we're going to pray for you to see if there was a difference. So they could pray, they could do musical imagery, they could do all that Dr. Ozzy stuff. Is it Ozmat? Yeah, that's his name. So they could do all this stuff. And what turns out is it doesn't matter if I pray for you. You have to believe it. So if I'm a physician evangelist, um, and I want a placebo effect, if I can convince you that you're going to get better, you probably are. I don't really have anything, I don't have a problem with that. I just have a problem with that if you are making money on it or if you're trying to get a new therapy approved. Um, and I think these data are very nice when you string them together in terms of thinking about that. I'll tell you, in Parkinson's disease, the clinical trials really don't change. The placebo effect doesn't change. So. Um, this is the placebo group here and a placebo group here. And it doesn't change all the way through. There's a certain placebo response that all of our patients have. This is a trial that really got me interested in this. So these green bars are the open label trials, and you can see the substantial benefit that patients received in this uh, advanced, uh, advanced patients received from a neurosurgical treatment of Parkinson's disease. So we open the skull and we put things in the skull and they get better. And then we come back and do a double-blind placebo control follow-up the controls get, uh, get worse, 
uh, and the actors don't get much better. There were no statistical differences in any of these. All these therapies have failed, and I will tell you that in the open label, there were no adverse events, and in the double-blind trial, there were lots of adverse events. Um, so if you hear from your patients that you don't like sham neurosurgical procedures for Parkinson's disease, what if everybody was getting fetal transplantation now for Parkinson's disease when we proved it didn't work over and over, or, or spheramine implanted in their brains when we proved that didn't work, or GDNF, or now serogene. So just to finish up, here is uh, the most interesting slide I've ever uh, really encountered to think about placebo effect. Apomorphine is a drug that binds to the postsynaptic receptor. It doesn't cause a release of dopamine. This is a scan that looks at dopamine release. So patients have to inject apomorphine. It's just like heroin. You get out all your stuff, you begin to inject yourself, and what they discovered in a double-blind placebo control fashion is that placebo injection improved dopamine release. The apomorphine doesn't do that at all. So it's just the act of giving that injection improves dopamine release. More dopamine is better treatment of Parkinson's disease. Dr. Stossel, who's done this work, has now shown that even if he has the patient get out all of their injection apparatus, the same thing happens. He doesn't have, they don't have to put needle to skin and they'll get this change. This is some more work he's done to compare fluoxetine non-responders or an antidepressant non-responder to a uh, antidepressant responder to placebo responders. And you can see that the responders is the same. It's part of the reason we have such difficulty improving efficacy in uh, antidepressant therapies is that you get a big placebo response if you want to get better, perhaps. So in, in finishing up, uh, I'd like to remind you that the ventral striatum um, in advanced Parkinson's disease, the reward satiety may be greater in, 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 uh, than in de novo patients, and their dependence on other therapies is greater, but their potential for benefit would be less. In terms of the dorsal striatum, probability mod uh, modeling suggests that the greatest potential for placebo response is at a 50-50 point, which is the point of most uncertainty, the point of biggest gamble. And as uh, John Stossel has told patients before he put them in the scanner to give them apomorphine, as he's moved from 50-50 to 33-66 to 1-to-1, 1-to-2, 1-to-3, 1-to-4, he finds that the lowest placebo response is 1-to-2. So the 50-50 chance somehow increases the risk and the thrill of maybe you're uh, really risking something and causes a, a response. The 1-in-2 yeah, I know I'll probably be more likely. And then we get to one and three, and your expectations increase with all of that. Um, and I would uh, just want to remind you that impulse control disorders result from a loss of dopaminergic terminals and increasing therapy um, because of this disturbance in mesolimbic and mesocortical feedback. It shares many similarities with addiction, and I think the importance of the Parkinson model to come up with new drug therapies for addiction is Parkinson's disease patients really do not like these addictions. And patients with addictions don't volunteer for these trials. Um, if you get a placebo, your addictions are uncurtailed, and it's very uncomfortable. So we cannot get patients to, uh, to enroll in these trials. Um, and I'll finish with a picture of my hero. So after leaving the uh, University of Missouri in 1995, I had a chance to run the Muhammad Ali Parkinson Research Center. And I learned many things from Muhammad. Uh, um, he taught me to try to give everything the best, give everyone the best I could, to include everyone, and most importantly, peace is always the answer, even in Missouri, which I'm sorry you're letting get more conservative. But thank you for your time. <laughs>